right, so if you look there in Psalm 19, it says in verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So it's saying here, you know, God's word, his law, his testimony, these are words, you know, words that are, can be used to describe, you know, the Bible itself. God's word, his law, and his testimony is perfect and sure. Meaning it's complete, you can trust it, what it has to say is, is, is all you need to know. You know, on whatever subject there is in life. You know, if there's something that you need to know about in life, you have the perfect word of God. The word, the law of the Lord is perfect. There's nothing missing. God didn't leave something out or forget, forget to include something. And he didn't add too much either. You know, there's enough there uh, that we need to concern ourselves with. We don't need to add to it either. It's perfect. And it's sure. It's something you can put your trust in. And it says there that it has an effect on those that hear it. If you notice, it says the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul, right? That's the effect that it has. And of course, you know, this sermon isn't about that, but we could talk about the fact that, you know, it's the Bible that gets people saved. That's what converts the soul, is the law of the Lord. The word of God is what has the power to convert the soul. But it says it converts the soul, and then not only that, it also says the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That's the title of the sermon this morning, making wise the simple. And what I want to preach to you about this morning is the subject of child uh, child rearing or discipline, specifically, you know, spanking, you know, dealing with your kids in that way. Um, it's a you know it's a very important topic. It's something that we all have to understand, and it's something the Bible has a lot to say about. It's not something that's just kind of on the you know just kind of there. You got to kind of strain to find it. The Bible's very discipline our children. Okay. Now, before I even get into that subject, I want because it's a negative topic, you know, it's not a very popular topic, but it's it is the Bible nonetheless. And you know, I'm a Baptist preacher. That's what I'm here to do is to preach the Word of God. Yeah. And you can like it or lump it. You know, people can can uh, you know do what they want with it. My job is simply to put it out there and let you know what the Bible says about this subject. And I want us to point out I want, what I want to point out first of all is that you know God's Word is what makes us wise. Through both positive and negative reinforcement. You know, the title of the sermon is Making Wise the Simple. And, you know, there's different ways you can, you can impart wisdom onto somebody. And the Bible, you know, imparts wisdom onto us through, you know, the positive aspects of it, but also the negative aspects of it. Look there in verse 8. It says, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. You know, it's a very positive thing to think about that, you know, if we obey God's commandments, there's going to be rejoicing. It says the command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. It says more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, and sweeter, uh, and, and sweeter also than the honeycomb, the honey and the honeycomb. So these are some very you know positive verses, right? Be rejoicing, be enlightening. Uh, the fact that they're more precious than gold, that they're sweeter than honey. You know, God's word has a lot of positive things to try and encourage us to obey it. But also notice the negative. It says in verse 11, Moreover, by them, the statutes of the Lord, moreover, by them, is thy servant warned. There's also a lot of strong warning, a lot of negative, you know, reinforcement in the Bible. It's not all just sweetness and light. It's also a lot of negative, hard things that are in the Bible. And in keeping of them is great reward. But he uses, you know, the negative just as much as the positive when he's trying to impart wisdom unto the simple. <clears throat> and God's, war God's word warns us of disobedience. But what happens when we disobey? With the hope that we will be wise. God says, look, if you disobey, if you don't keep my statutes, if you don't keep my commandments, you know, you, you as my servant have been warned, here's what's going to happen. And the reason why he warns us is so that out of the hopes that we will not have to be disciplined, that we'll obey, and in that process, we will be made wise. You know, we might not understand something, we're simple about something, but when we understand God's word on the topic or subject, we're made wise. And often that wisdom is imparted unto us through, you know, negativity, the, you know, the threat of punishment from God. And, you know, go over to Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12. You see, if we do not take heed to the warnings of God's word, we will suffer chastening. There's going to be suffering in our life if we ignore uh, the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, if we disregard them. You know, there's going to be consequences, negative consequences. The Bible says, 
Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. This is the simple law in the, in the universe. It's just one of God's basic laws. That whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. If you want to disregard the Bible and disregard the statutes and the commandments of God's word, that's, you know, go ahead, but just understand now, your ser you know, thy servant is, you know, is warned that there's going to be consequences for that. You're not just going to, it's not just this gray area. It's not neutral. There's no spiritual Sweden in the Christian life, so to speak, that you are going to be punished for that. You're going to suffer for that because you're not, you're sowing to the flesh. You're not sowing to the spirit. And the Bible is very clear that God chastens us. You know, he uses negative reinforcement. Why? To make wise the simple. It says there in verse Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So he's saying, look, that you know, chastening is what brings the peace, peaceable fruit of righteousness unto those that are chastened, those that are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees... And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather, rather let it be healed. So what he's showing us here is that chastening is beneficial. Now it says, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. And isn't that the truth? You know, anyone that's ever been, you know, physically chastened, like the Bible tells us, that's not a pleasant, you know, that's not a pleasant experience. Or anyone who's ever been chastened by society, well, that's not, there's nothing fun about that. You know, there's not there's nothing fun being chased. It's, it's not fun for the person being chastened, but you know, it's also not fun for the person doing the chastening. You know, God gives us all these warnings and these negative reinforcements to try and get us to to be wise, so that we can avoid the chastening. You know, it's no fun. You know, that, and that's why so many parents today they, they leave off the chastening. They don't want to do the spanking. They don't want to do. This. It's not fun for them either. They don't have any joy in it. But it's necessary. Because that's what's going to make wise the simple. And here's the thing. We all start out simple. Every child in the room is simple. And it doesn't mean that, you know, they're, they're dumb or they're stupid. It's just they, they lack the knowledge. They lack understanding. That comes with time and experience and knowledge and understanding. Okay? And it's our, part, it's our job as parents, you know, as, as elders, as people that, you know, are... are Involved in these children's lives to impart wisdom under them. Now, obviously, the chastening, that's the job of the parent. But just by our godly example, we can be, the, you know, we can instruct the simple that are among us and help them to be wise. But the, the, the primary, uh, you know, application of this sermon this morning is that to make wise the simple, you as a parent have to go through that grievous process of chastening your child. And for your child to become wise, they also have to go through that grievous process of being chastened. We need to go through that, otherwise you will not be made wise. <clears throat> so chastening is beneficial that it imparts wisdom unto the chastened. Now go over to Proverbs chapter 23, Proverbs chapter 23. And when you get to Proverbs, you know, keep something there because, like I said earlier, the Bible is not, you know, vague on the subject. And when you read the book of Proverbs, there's just verse after verse after verse after verse, after verse about chastening your children. It says in Proverbs chapter 23, look at verse 15. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign <laughs> shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. You know, the Bible's teaching us here that when we have wise children, you know, that's going to bring gladness to us. That's going to make our hearts to rejoice. But how is that, you know, no one's going to argue with that. No one's going to say, well, that, that sounds nice, but I, no thanks. Everyone wants, any, you know, any normal parent wants that. Any, any parent wants to you know, be able to have their heart rejoice. They want their heart to be uh, glad that their children are wise. They want wise children who are going to make right decisions. They're not going to make dumb decisions. They're going to do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. They want them to speak right things. They want them to have wisdom in their life. You know, no one's going to, no parent's going to say, well, that's not my kid. You know, I want my kid to be a foolish derelict their whole life. No, no one wants that for their kid if they truly love and care for their children. Right? No one would argue with those verses there. No one would argue, but, but back it up two verses. Okay, back up to verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. 
Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now that's, the, you know, everyone likes verse 15. But no one, you know, that verse 13, that's where you start to lose people. That's where people start to say, well, you know, that's an old, antiquated book. You know, there's, there's better ways. No, there isn't. This is, you know, the, the testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. You know, the way you're going to make the simple child wise is through physically correcting them. Withhold not the cor correction from the child. What is that correction? Verse 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod. It's talking about literally spanking your children. Okay? That's what the Bible teaches. Now, you know, the word beat today has a different meaning. You know, today we say beat. You know, if I say, hey, you need to beat your children, you probably envision me like, you know, dressing up like the ultimate warrior or something, getting a folding chair, you know. I'm up on the, you know, I'm not getting up on the top ropes and dropping elbows on my kids or anything like that. That's not what it means by beat, just like pummeling them with their fists and beating them around. No, that is wrong. That's child abuse. You'll provoke your children to wrath. You know, that's something that people do out of anger. That's not going to impart wisdom. And I'm going to get into the specifics later of how to go about this, what exactly we're talking about when it comes to beating the children, your children. But just don't let that word scare you. Thou shalt beat him with the rod. You know, a literal implement. But notice here, it's the beating that makes wise, that makes the heart wise. It's the correction that makes the lips speak right things. You know, if you want verse 15 for your children, you got to have verse 13. You can't have one without the other. <coughs> <clears throat> Look at Proverbs chapter 21. Go to Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21, it says this, when the, in verse 11. Verse 11, it says, When the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. And when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. Now, you could look at verse 11 and say, well, that's talking about two different people there. The scorner is punished, and the simple is made wise. And I agree with that. You know, a lot of times in life, we can learn things. We don't have to learn things ourselves. We can watch what other people go through, and we can be made wise. You know, we're simple. We don't have understanding in some area. Then we watch somebody else do something wrong, and we say, well, don't do that. And, you know, that's the best way to learn things, too, by the way, rather than having to go through that experience yourself. You know, and it works the other way, too. You know, you could, you could see you're, you're simple concerning something, and you see somebody do something right. You know, they do things the right way. You know, you can learn that way as well. So you can't say, you know, that this is talking about two different people, but what I want to point out here is the sequence, okay, of, of, of events here. The scorner, the scornful is punished. You know, the person is just kind of mocking, just kind of, you know, has a very nonchalant, just casual attitude, just kind of scoffs at the word of God, you know, scoffs at rules, kind of rebellious, you know, just the scorner is punished. The simple gains wisdom. So when you, you know, when we're rebellious, when we're, you know, when we're having this kind of a, a scornful attitude towards, you know, the God or towards our parents or towards whatever authority there is in our life, when we're kind of scorning it, you know, one, you were simple, right? And, but when we're punished, then wisdom, we gain wisdom from that. We say, oh, you know, being scornful, being mocking, you know, breaking the rules, that's probably not a good idea. You know, I should probably stop doing this. And that the simple gains wisdom, Right? And it's only when you begin to gain wisdom, you know, that you can begin to be instructed and receive knowledge. That's the process there. He says the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise, and when, he, and when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. You know, you say, I want wise kids that are going to have knowledge, that are going to understand how to live life. Well, you know what? You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to punish them when they're scornful. You're going to have to, you want to impart wisdom and instruct them. You know, you have to deal with the foolishness that's in your child's heart. Someone has to be punished before knowledge is received. Often. You know, sometimes you can tell your kids, don't do this. Stop. And it's not, but they go ahead and they do it anyway. And then they have to get punished. They score at whatever rule that is. I mean, you think about it in society. We have all these laws and these rules in society, but people break the law all the time. They think, uh, you know what? They don't. They scorn the law, and then, you know, in their simplicity, they're taken, and they're punished, right? And they receive wisdom. They say, oh, that's, you know, there are consequences for my actions. And then they can be instructed. Then they can move on and, and, and learn other things. 
But somebody has to be punished before knowledge is received often. Okay? And I'm going to get into this here in a minute. But go over to Proverbs chapter 14. The Bible says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. You know, before you can impart wisdom, before you can impart knowledge, you have to deal with foolishness. And if you can't deal with foolishness, you're wasting your breath. That's what the Bible's saying here. Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. He's going to scorn. He's going to mock. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 9, If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. There's no point in dealing with a fool, of speaking to a fool. You have to deal with foolishness and scorning before you can impart wisdom and instruction unto somebody. Look at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 6. A scorner seeketh with wisdom and findeth it not. Why? Because he hasn't been made simple. He hasn't been punished. He hasn't been humbled. He's looking for it, but he, what? he's a scorner. He's a scoffer. He's not going to receive it. But knowledge that understand it. You know, when that scorner is made simple and he's given, you know, he's punished and, he's, and he humbles himself, then the knowledge comes more easily. Why? Because the foolishness, the scorning, has been dealt with. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. It reminds me, go to Proverbs 17, but it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither pass your, por your pearls before swine. He says, that, you know, that just don't waste your time on some people. Now look, I'm not, when it comes to our children, you know, that's not wasting your time. Uh, this is everything I'm reading, you know, these last few verses is obviously referring to other people that we don't have any control over. And what I'm trying to show us is that when it gets to a point with people, look, if you can't deal with the foolishness in somebody, there's no point in trying to give them any wisdom. If you don't have the, if they're beyond your control, you know, what you're just wasting your time trying time trying to impart any kind of wisdom to them. But here's the thing, our, that's not the case with our children, at least it shouldn't be. So when we have kids, you know, they're under our rule, you know, we have an opportunity. To, to, you know, punish them, to deal with the scorning, to deal with the foolishness, and then impart wisdom and instruction and knowledge so that they can grow up and be wise people. <clears throat> but look at Proverbs chapter 17, verse 16. Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? You know, <laughs> why is there a price? What, he's trying to get wisdom. What, what can I give for it? It doesn't matter. Because you don't have a heart for it. It's not going to, it's not the wisdom that you need. If you don't have the heart for it, if the heart hasn't been dealt with, if the scorning and the foolishness have not been dealt with, it, it doesn't make, it, there's no point. It doesn't make any sense. So in order to raise a wise child, you must address the foolishness that is done by dealing with the heart. You must address the foolishness that is within them, and that is done by dealing with the heart. That's how you deal with the child's heart. That's how you address, you know, if you want to impart wisdom and have, have them, you know, grow up and speak right things and rejoice your heart and be a pleasure unto you and not a shame, you know, you have to deal with their heart. And, you know, the, one of the best ways to do that is through the posterior anatomy, okay, through the seat of instruction. That's, that's, that's how you deal with that, and we're going to get to that here in a minute. But go over to Proverbs chapter 22, Proverbs chapter 22. Because, you know, when you preach a sermon like this, a lot of people kind of tune you out. And they say, oh, not my sweet little, you know, kooky poo or whatever. You know, they're <laughs> not my little angel. No way. They're, they're so sweet. And, you know, what's probably going on is they're playing you. <laughs> they, you know, what's really going on is, is, is they've got you figured out. Proverbs chapter 22. This goes for every child because look at verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, meaning every single child. Now notice there, it says it's bound. You know, it's tied up. It's tangled. It's knotted. It's not just in there with a little slip knot that you're just going to go, whoop, and oh, foolishness is going to depart. No, it says it's bound in there. You know, whenever I read this verse, I always think about, because probably I, I heard this illustration on the same topic from another preacher, but... You know, whenever I read this, I think about Rahab the harlot and the, the two spies. Remember that story? And when they, she helped them to escape, they, they tied that scarlet rope. And, you know, when they, tie, when, they, when they tied that scarlet thread, do you think they just, like, just did a simple little knot? When, I mean, if you're putting your life on the line, you're going to, you know, 
let yourself down by this rope. You're gonna make, you're gonna tie that thing to the fridge, you know, several times, something really, well, a guy like me in the fridge might not. <laughs> you're gonna find something strong, and the point I'm trying to make is you're gonna bind that thing in there. You know, that's what the Bible is trying to get across here. Foolishness in a child's heart is bound. It's in there tight. It's in there deep. It's, you know, the other illustration I've used in the past is, is when I worked in, uh, in uh, you know, you know, excavating and things like that, we had to use these lifting straps. And he went over uh, these big nylon straps that have the big loops on them. And sometimes you'd have to make longer ones. You'd loop through, loop them through one another. You you put the loops through, and then the, the machine would pick up some big piece of you know concrete or whatever, some real big heavy load, and set it in place. And then you take that that same strap off. And when you went to undo it, man, that those those things had so much pressure. It's so much tension, they were just bound together. It's like they were one cord almost. They were, it's almost like they were fused. And you couldn't just take your hands and pull them apart. I mean, a lot of times you'd have to take a hammer and hit it, and you'd have to get a claw hammer and start working on that thing. A lot of times, I even remember having to throw it on the ground and drive over it with the truck. Just run the tire over it several times just to get that thing to start to bound, right? And I'm, try- I'm using that illustration to tell you this morning, that's what foolishness is in the heart of a child. It's bound in there. And you know, anyone who has kids or has been around kids knows this is the case. That you know, you don't have to tell your kids how to do the wrong thing. It's just it's instinctive. It's nature. They just know how to do bad. Right? You're always having to tell them to do the right thing. Right? You always have to correct them. You always have to tell them, don't do that, do this. Right? Why is that? Because it's bound in there. Foolishness is t- and notice where it, where it is. It's in the heart. It's not in the intellect. You know, sometimes the kids do things and you go, what were you thinking? And the truth is, they weren't. <laughs> you know, they were acting out of nature. They don't even, they just do things just out of nature. You know, they, they treat, you know, their siblings poorly. They disobey. They, they just, they do something they know they're not supposed to do. And if they get caught, they're going to get in trouble. But they do it anyway. Why is that? Because foolishness is bound in their heart. It's not, it can't be reasoned with. You know, you can't sit them down and talk them through it. That's not enough. You know, words are not enough. You have to understand that when you're dealing with foolishness in a child's heart, you're dealing with sin. You're dealing with a nature there. You're dealing with a sinner, right? Remember that the next time, you you know, you pick up your little newborn or whatever. You know, I know a guy used to do this. His first, when it was first born, he picked up, he looked at her. The day she was born, he goes, you little sinner. Right? And what was he doing? He was telling, he was reminding himself that that little sweet, little, you know, seemingly innocent, harmless is a sinner. And that foolishness is bound in its heart from the day it's born. And if we don't deal with that, you know, we're going to raise monsters, potentially. I mean, I know God's grace is always there. And the Holy Spirit can do things that we can't. But what I'm saying is this, is that you need to understand that when you're dealing with Foolishness in your uh, your heart's child, your child of your, the heart of your child, you're dealing with a sinner. That's what's going on here. And it says, you know, it's still, it's in the found in the heart of a child, meaning any child, no exceptions. I don't care what kid it is. Every child has this foolishness bound in their heart. You say, well, how do you deal with it? How do you how do you loosen up that foolishness in a child's heart? Is it through talking to them? Is it through reasoning? Is it through, you know, having long discussions? Is it through lectures? No. It says, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The rod of correction. And, you know, he's not, that's not, you know, a euphemism. That's not just something, you know, that it's up for interpretation. He's talking about a literal implement. About literally taking something and beating your child with it. And driving the foolishness from them. And you know what? It says there that the rod of correction is very effective at loosening up that foolishness. Not only does it loosen it up, but then it says that it drives it far from him. It makes such an impression. It works so well. It's so effective that that foolishness seems to just be a mi- miles away. You know, kids, they do something foolish. They get a proper punishment with the rod of correction or whatever it is. You know, they get a spanking. The next time they go to do that, that spanking has made such an impression, it's like that foolishness is, is departing. They instantly recall, oh, I remember what happened last time I did this. And the foolishness departs. And they don't even think about doing anything. 
Now, obviously, sometimes that foolishness comes back around, you know, after a while, and they need a stark reminder of, of not to not do that, and you have to, you know, it's not like a one, one and done type of deal. But the Bible is showing us here that physical discipline is the only way of properly dealing with it. Properly dealing with it, of driving it far from it. And I'm not saying, you know, you can't use some of these other things as, you know, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, supplemental. These are things you might be able to add. But to me, it seems like, you know, the spanking is, you know, that's not how God deals with us. You know, God, when we get out of line with God, God chastens with us, and then it's done. It's over. There's no, you know, these additional things on top of it. But physical discipline, you know, is the most effective way of dealing with the foolishness that's in your child's heart. Meaning this, no timeouts. No timeouts. You know what timeouts do? Is it just breeds animosity and bitterness. That's what it does. You know, and I, and you know, I remember before I had kids, you know, I had a, I, a, a family member that had a, a couple kids before me. And I, I've been reading the Bible, I've been hearing this type of preaching, and so I could sit back and, and watch these people's kids who, who did, you know, things God's way, and then I could watch the worldly way of doing things. And boy, what a difference. Boy, boy, let me tell you, a huge difference in how those kids turned out. I mean, the, the person giving out timeouts is just, you know, you go over and just, there's just markers all over the wall. It's like, <laughs> what'd you do? And they're like, oh, but you got a timeout. And then the next week, there's some more colors. You know, it's like, there's a mosaic going on here. You know, it's an ongoing, why? Because the foolishness hasn't been dealt with in a timeout. You know what a kid's doing in a timeout? How much longer to get back out there and do that again? That's what they're doing. That's all they're doing. Make this out 30 minutes, and then I can go do something else. Because a timeout, there's, what, what's the, you know, I remember one of the dumbest punishments I got as a child was, go to your room. Oh, you mean where all my toys are? All right. See <laughs> you know? Oh, you were playing hide and seek and put the car in reverse and it rolled out in the street? Yeah, I did that. <laughs> did I get a correction? I wasn't trying to back the car. I was just a dumb kid. Oh, there's the joystick. <laughs> Then it's rolling out in the middle of the residential <laughs> street, right? And mom's like, go to your room. I'm like, well, that wasn't so bad. I mean, that's kind of fun. <laughs> you know, light, literally light a field on fire. That's where the fire department's showing up. That's a long story. You know, I'm not, wasn't an arsonist as a child, okay? I'm not today either, right? There's a, there's a story to it, okay? What would I get? 45 minutes in my bedroom. My, you know, you know, I, I, I did learn my lesson a little bit. I didn't light any more fires, but <laughs> right, that's weak punishment. No, and how about here's this other thing I've seen: positive affirmations. The kids just being mouthy, talking back, disobeying. I love you. Why would you talk to me like that? Don't you know I love you? This, and I remember when I first heard or saw this, I'm just like. And it's just like, you're going to find yourself saying that a lot, you know, just using your words. Or the, the classic countdown, right? I'm going to give you the count of 10 to knock that off. One, two, and the, you know, the kid will wait till like nine, and then it's like, we'll stop. Wouldn't you just rather deal with it right away? Anyway, you know, these, these other things that are, you know, not as effective, the timeouts, the positive affirmations, the groundings, the restrictions. Now, you know, the grounding and restrictions, you know, taking away privileges as kids get older and stuff, I could see where you could t bring that into play. You know, where it's not just the physical discipline that they could actually lose. Because, you know, that does hurt. That does start to kind of hit home with kids eventually. <clears throat> but the Bible is very clear here that's the rod of correction that works. You know, physically beating your child loosens up the foolishness that's bound in the heart. Right? That's what the Bible says. And that's very it's very clear. Okay. So then, you know, people, you know, maybe you're convinced. Maybe you're like, oh, you know what, Brother Corbin, the Bible, the Bible says, I believe it. That's great. And a lot of people are on the, the same page with the Bible. They they agree with this. But you know, especially with newer parents, then you get a lot of questions. They start they're faced with that reality of having to deal with the foolishness in a child's heart. And they start to scratch their heads and they start to think, well, all right, well, how do you do this? You know. I know it was big for us because, you know, I wasn't, you know, properly dealt with as a child, you know. We got a lot of, you know, upside the head, yelling, throwing things, all these other stuff, you know. 
and their parents were unsaved. It's just what came naturally to them, whatever. But even unsaved people know, know, sometimes know enough. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is this, is that, you know, a similar position that I was in, you know, when we first have our kids, like, well, we understand this is what the Bible says, but how do you really go about it? What's the practical application here? We'll go over to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. One of the main questions people have is, you know, when to start? You know, when do you start dealing with the foolishness in your, in your child's heart? I would say this, as soon as they can exercise their own. Sweet little child can start to, in some way, shape, or form, tell you no, or go against your will, that's the time to start. Now, let me just clarify, I'm not saying you start out with, you know, the rod. You know, your your little baby, you know, is, is, is being defiant. You're not just going to be like, you know, <laughs> pull it back. There's a way to go about it, okay? We're going to talk about that, too. But, here, you know, when to start, you know, it's when they, that's what I was told is this, when they begin to exercise their will. Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. It says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. So, you know, let's just park it right there for a minute. Look, you say, I disagree with the sermon. I think that's cruel and unusual punishment. I think you're way off base. I don't think you should physically discipline your children at all. When the Bible says you hate your son, and you know, we'll talk about that later. It says you hate your child. Not in the sense that, you know, you, you wish them ill, but it's not that it, in the sense that you're not, you don't really love them the way you should because you're not dealing and help, help dealing with the foolishness and imparting wisdom under them, helping them. Okay? That's, you know, I don't want to go down that avenue. When do you start? It says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now that word betimes simply means early. And it doesn't mean first thing in the morning. <laughs> That's not what he means by early there, okay? Like, wake up, kids. Time for your spanking. You know? <laughs> what do we do? Hey, the Bible says betimes. Let's just, let's just start right now. Right? <laughs> now there is the Chinese proverb, right? Beat your, beat your son every day. If you don't know why, he does. All right. Now that's not Bible. I'm not going to suggest that. <coughs> but it's saying here, but times, as in when the child is young, early in life. You ever hear the terrible twos? Usually, the terrible twos is the, is, the, is is because somebody didn't deal with things, but times. And you know, sometimes this time take this is the part that really takes people by shock. They'll say, "Oh, I'll discipline my kid," you know, when they're older, when they two, three. I'm saying earlier than that. Earlier than that, and every kid's different. And look, here's the thing about child: when you're, if you're going to be serious about doing this, you're going to make mistakes as a parent. No one's going to get this perfectly right, and a lot of it you have to learn along the way. Okay. But here about you know when they can exercise their will. What's an example of that? When they understand no, and any parent can look in their child and tell when they can understand no when their child understands them, even if before a child can even speak, they understand words. When you say no. They, and then you start to associate the word no with like a little hit, a little slap on the hand, a little slap on the thigh. Then they start to understand, okay, when they say no, I don't do what I'm thinking about doing. Right? And when is that? That's early on. How about when they're mobile? As soon as they start to crawl. Now, again, I'm not saying you break out the belt and the paddle and start going down on a little, you know, toddler. You know, it's just crawling around. But I am saying when that child starts to exercise their, their will, you know, when they learn to walk, when they're crawling around, which is early on, and you can say, come here, and they look at you and they just go, uh-uh, I'm going to go do my thing. That's the time, right then. That is the times. That's when you need to start dealing with your kid. And at least get them, you know, I'm not saying you're going to drive all the foolishness out of their heart at such a young age. But what you're going to start doing is you're going to start loosening it up. You're going to start loosening that knot of foolishness that's bound in their heart up. And you're going to start to instruct them and teach them that, you know, hey, I don't get just to do whatever I want. That there's punishment, that there's, you know, pain involved if I do the, the wrong thing, that there's consequences for my actions. It starts to get them to, that starts to register with them very early on. You know, I, I, and here's the thing, the sooner you do that, the, 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 the easier it is to start to, you know, deal with the children, you know, and get them to listen. You know, I'll, get, I'll just use myself as an example, you know, our, our youngest, you know, uh, Heather, she's 
I mean, she's to turn two this month. I know I forgot to put it in the bulletin, but <laughs> bad dad, right? But she is turning two, you know, just, I remember it was just a few months back, you know, she's just, you know, kids get at a certain age, they start to just throw their fits. It's time to take a nap. Which is totally ironic. I would love as an adult to be told to go take a nap. I would love nothing more than my boss to just walk in and be like, go take a nap. You're tired. You need to lay down for an hour. Yes, sir. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't hear me throwing a fit. You know, but, you know, kids, they feel like they're going to miss out on something or whatever. And they need a nap. They're cranky, whatever. And then they, you lay them down. You know, mom's laying them down. And the kid's just in there, like, screaming. You know, whatever it is. And you know what? I took her, and I just took her little diaper off, took a little plastic spoon, and stop your fit. Stop your fit. Eventually, he stopped. You know how many times I've had to do that? Once. Just once. I'm not saying I'll never have to do it again. But I'm saying sometimes there's, 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 you know, as their kids are coming up, what I've noticed is that there's milestones when they start, where it starts to register with them. Because now when she throws a fit, I just say, stop your fit. And she instantly goes back to that day in her mind because I made an impression, right? Literally and figuratively, made an impression on her little backside that if you throw a fit and I say stop, this is what happens next. And you know, it's amazing. Even I'm sure the foolishness will come back around and she'll forget. But even now I can just say, stop your fit. And she climbs right up and does that little you know, thing. The kids are trying to suck it up, you know? <clears throat> Which is important. You want your kids to be able to obey your voice. Especially when they get to that running and walking age. You're just going to, you know, want to go play with the fire truck that's driving by. Or the semi or whatever. And you're going to have to say, no, stop, come back here. You want to have already dealt with that foolishness by the time they get to that age. <clears throat> so start with times, you know. So we got to kind of the when, right? Start early. Start early in their life and start loosening up that knot. And you know what? It's something that's going to take, it's going to go on for a long time. And as you know, it gets more intense, but hopefully it tapers off, you know, as they, they reach their, their, in their teen and adult, you know, towards their later teen years, or I don't know, I, I will see how it goes with my I'm kind of, it's kind of, uh, you know, new territory for me, but where? Okay, here's the big question, where? Well, the, the, uh, as I alluded to earlier, the posterior anatomy, the gluteus maximus, right? And nowhere else, and nowhere else. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. And you need to do that. That's the one spot, and it's the perfect spot that God has designed that's, you know, soft and cushy, right? And it's full of nerve endings that are very sensitive. You, got, you know, I think that's not, that's not a coincidence that God did that. And I think that's where he's talking about, you know, the back, the, the buttocks. And nowhere else. No slapping them upside the head, stuff like that. Now, you know what? If people do that, I, you know, I get it. I mean, I guess, you know, every now and then a good slap upside the head doesn't hurt anybody, right? <laughs> you know, but when you're little kids, I mean, just knocking them over or something, you know, it's, like, it's, it's just not, it's not, what, I don't believe the way to do it. I believe that God has given that part of the anatomy for that reason. Okay, so the where is pretty self-explanatory. I think you know if you if you're struggling with that, you know, talk to me later because I'm. Gonna... But here here here's the next thing I want to spend some time about talking about. And look, this is important stuff. And you say, "Oh, well, I don't have kids." Well, one day you might. One day you know you know I'm a young person. I'm not even married. One day you might be. Are you going to get on God's program? Or are you going to do? You're going to go read Doctor Oz. Or you're gonna go talk to Dr. Phil about how to raise your, your kid and deal with foolishness. He's gonna you're gonna end up with a frat. So, you know, when I heard preaching like this before I was married, before I had kid, I I listened up and I paid attention, I remembered it. Because, you know, that's what I knew one day, Lord willing, that it would be something that I needed. So let's talk about the how. How to start. This is a you know, there's a a, a thing in, in weightlifting called progressive overload, right? Linear progression, right? Progressive overload, where you slowly get more and more intense over time. It's the same way with child rearing, with this aspect of discipline. You know, you don't just start out with a rod on, on your little toddler who's, who's just scooting away from you or whatever, and trying to run away, or throwing a fit and won't listen. You know, that's where you start out with, you know, the finger on the, the little thigh. You know, let's pull the diaper back a little bit, 
No. You know, and start to teach them that. You say that's so cruel. Oh, come on. You know? <laughs> Seriously. And you'll be, I mean, if people, people love the fruit. People love children that are well behaved. You know, I'm going to brag on my kids for a minute. Every time my wife takes them out in public, she gets compliments how well behaved they are. They're not. And then you see the other kids that are just literally throwing themselves in the aisle, screaming the whole time, running away, little brats. Right? But here's the thing. If you want, you want the compliments, you want the fruit, you know, you've got to take the root. You can't have the fruit without the root. And the root is no. The times, early and consistently. You know, I, I know I talked about, you know, keeping it, you know, the hinder parts, but I could even see a little slap on the hand. The little kid is ready to just go stick something in a light socket. No. Go around and tell them, no, no, no. <laughs> Get used to that word, no. And you know, the, the, the physical stuff backs up that word, no. They, they catch on to that real quick. You know, and I already talked about this, is that you can rely on the shock factor for a little while. You know, when that kid first gets their hand slapped, they're like, well, what's, this is new. Ow, that really hurt. And they, you know, that shock factor will kind of stay with them for a while. And you can use that. You know, and then even, even like I said earlier, if you do give them a little bit of a shock, a little bit of a shock treatment, right? A little, the word no really starts to resonate with them. But you know what? The foolishness is bound in there. You haven't driven it away. Eventually, that's not going to be enough for them. They're going to weigh out their, what they want to do and the little, and they're going to go, I'd rather just take the slap on the hand. I'll take the finger on the thigh. I'll take the, the no. And that's where you have to start working into implements of chastening. Right? We have to start devising these devices. I meant to get it earlier. Excuse me for one minute. Honey, where is our, where is our white plastic spoon? Do you have it available? I know what everyone knows what this is, but I need it for, for purposes. Don't worry, you're OK. <laughs> did she did she flinch? But see that's great because that's the point I wanted to make. This, this is what she flinches at. She doesn't flinch at this. Because she's used to this. You know, a lot of people say you shouldn't use something. I think it's crueler to use your hand. Because now you're want them, now they're afraid of this. And look, you can't put this down. You can't set this aside and, and then hug them and hold them and let them know that everything's okay with these. Because they're, oh, you know. And I remember even as a child, you know, and, you know, I'm not trying to search my mother's reputation or anything, you know, God rest her soul and all that. But look, I was one that was kind of swatted about. And I can tell you as a kid, I did that. My mom would just walk by and just kind of swing her arm. Like, Whoa, what did I do? You know? Right? It's a thing. That's why this is so important, right? And I know that you guys think this is for baking. And it's like, it's for, it's for cooking buns, but not the buns you're thinking of, right? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, this is this is a different kind of batter, right? <laughs> yeah. But you want to use these. This is this is the next progression. And here's the thing about and then and, be, and then you go beyond this. Like my last pastor, you know, we weren't there long enough, but eventually what he would do for his people is he would take a piece of plexiglass. This is what he had. And he would cut a plexiglass paddle and drill holes in it so the air wasn't there, put some rope around the handle, and then just hang that thing somewhere very visible. So on the fridge. So every time the kids walked to the kitchen, they would be reminded that you live in this house and this is what happens here. You know, we, we haven't gotten there, but there's other things, you know, um, belts are ones that are, are very, you know, you know, you should probably restrict it to those type of things. You know, and the belt, you know, obviously you want to be careful with that. You, don't, you know, buckles are not to be used, obviously, okay? <laughs> This needs to be said because people people go overboard with this stuff, true, yeah. and then they then they ruin it for everybody. Then everyone's then you know then the states are saying, well you have you can, well, you can only use your hand, and you can actually do more damage with your hand you know than, than you can with an implement that's widely wisely used. Okay. Then you start now. Let me just give you some tips, some practical tips on you know on how to use this and why. And here's the thing. Use, in my experience, use plastic. 
A lot of people get wood and stuff like that, but you, you know, there's, I'm just telling you like it is, okay? There's splinters. Sometimes they split and then it pinches when it hits and stuff like that. It's, I would just recommend this, okay? You're looking to get a sting. Whatever you use to discipline your children, to drive the foolishness out of their heart, whatever you're going to use, you were looking for a sting. You don't want blunt force. And a lot of times that's what hands do. If you're just using the hand, that's very blunt. It's very jarring. That's not what you want on your kids. You don't want to jar vertebrae. You don't want to dislocate something. You don't want to, you know, have blunt force trauma. You want a sting. You know, the great thing about a sting is that a lot of times it doesn't, it doesn't leave a mark. It just you know, gets a little red for a second and goes away. Ouch. <laughs> And on that point of not causing blunt force, here's another thing, just a practical tip that people need to hear. Don't spank your diapers. I've seen people do this, where they just, they take their kid, they've got even a spoon or something, and then they go through a diaper. And you have to hit way harder to get a, the effect through a diaper. And now you're going, now you're becoming blunt force, which is dangerous, you don't wanna do that. What you're looking for is a sting, and now, Say, well, how hard? You know, this is only struggled with, especially when kids start to get older and you, you, it doesn't start to have the same effect as it used to when they were little and, 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 and more sensitive. You know, after they've been through a few rounds and they get calloused, you know, they're just like they're built up, they're hardened. You know, you have to say, well, how hard? Well, here's the thing if you're in doubt of how hard to, to use these implements, when in doubt, try it out. That's my motto. When in doubt, try it out. And I mean on yourself. Or if you have a willing spouse. You know? <laughs> or an unsuspecting spouse. <laughs> what was that for? You know, just trying it out. Did it hurt? Okay, good. You know? But this is what I did. Literally, when we tried to figure this out, I would just, ow, that really hurt. Now I know. That's about all I need. You just get that snap, too. It's all in the wrist, people. <laughs> right? But when in doubt, try it out. Is this, is this hard enough? Is this too hard? You know? I, and honestly, ask, hey, can you can you hit me on the thigh, honey, and show me how hard that we should be hitting with these implements, how hard we should be going? I'm serious. <clears throat> and here's the thing, you know, the next kind of question is, when is it enough? You know, when when do you just say it's it's enough? When do you tough question because every kid's different. And you know, it's probably best to stop too short than to go too far, honestly. <clears throat> and and here's the thing, some people, but here's the thing, some people, they stop too short when they shouldn't. And some kids are different. I mean, I'm not gonna embarrass any of my children, but we had one child. When it was time for that child to, to sleep in their own bed, it was, I mean, it was a war. And I was like, well, my other kids weren't like this. Why is it, because every kid's different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm out there, you know, the, the kid gets out of bed, and it's, it, it's going to the bathroom, everyone's trying to sleep, get in bed. Just get out of bed just to, 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 to what? To do what? To flex their own will. To show them they're the boss, not us, <laughs> right? So then it's pull out the chair, get the, get the spoon or the, the belt or the paddle or whatever, stick it out, and whack, whack, whack. Let them have it, the tears come, they go back, you go to bed, say, oh, that's done. Nope, two minutes later. I mean, I'm telling you, you got to the point I would spank the child, send him to bed, and I would just wait there in the hallway. And they'd come, and then as soon as they saw me, Ooh, it's like, yeah, <laughs> duh, what are you gonna figure it out? I, I know this game. And then it's right back at it again. And I'm, I'm saying, it went on and on and on. But today, it's no problem. The other kids, it's like, you could just look at them, you know, say, and then it's whoop, and they just fix it immediately, right? <laughs> Every kid's different. You know, how, how far you have to, you know, you learn by doing. You know, you learn by getting in there and actually practicing this. You will gain the wisdom and the knowledge and experience as a parent of, of how much is too much and how much is not enough, okay? Well, that's how we learned a lot of it. Now, go to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. I know I'm going a little long this morning, but... And I know this isn't, you know... This is a real practical sermon. You know, this isn't the most exciting sermon. You know, and a lot of the kids in here probably aren't appreciating it. <laughs> Don't tell them that. Don't remind them that. No. Shut up, Brother Corbin. Preach on, preach on something else. Where's the grace sermon? Where's the love sermon, right? But this is the stuff that, I mean, look, this is the kind of preaching that needs to take place. Look at the kind of people that are out there today. 
Look at the type of people that are just rude, disrespectful, making a mess out of their lives. Look at the kind of kids that are out there. But this, this kind of stuff isn't taking place anymore. This used to just be common knowledge. I mean, there used to be a day when you could beat other people's kids. And the parents would thank you. You know, I remember, uh, you know, a guy was telling me when he, when he was growing up, he was a little boy back in like the 60s or whatever, he was down at the train, train depot putting pennies out on the rail and the, and, the, and the train's trying to leave and the conductor's waiting for this kid. He's yelling at him. He would get, the conductor got out of the train, walked over, grabbed him, paddled his butt, and he knew who he was and then went and told his dad later, hey, your kid was down at the train depot and I, I spanked him. And he said, thanks. There's that story. I don't know if it's true or not, but we're in Tucson, so I'm going to tell it, right, about John Wayne. Where he was going through town on a, on a parade on a horse and this little boy ran out and just stood there out in front of him and he wouldn't get out of the way John Wayne in the middle of the parade in front of everybody got off his horse, spanked the kids behind and sent him out and got back on and carried on I mean that's, that was what this country was, used to be like you know, where you could even you know, when it was appropriate, discipline other people's kids I mean schools used to discipline people's kids and this might shock you but you know it's still legal in 18 states in this country to discipline children in public schools they leave it up to the to the to, to, the, to the, the, the local board and stuff like that, but as far as state law is concerned, Arizona is one of them, and then there's 18 others where it's still legal to use corporal punishment in a in a public school. Now, does that mean they all do it? No, but I'm telling you, there used to be a day and age not too long ago when it was just that was common practice, where a kid went to school and they acted up, the teacher would take him in the back and they would get paddled. In fact, my last in my church in Michigan. I, I knew that the guy I went to church with was the last kid to get spanked in the Saginaw public school system. That was like his badge of honor or something like that. He's <laughs> like, yeah, and he, he saying, I remember the principal took me in. He said, this is the last day I have to do this, and you're probably the last kid that's ever going to get it. And he got it. He got paddled. <laughs> you know, and he's, he's only like 10 or 15 years older than me, so, which is very young, by the way. So, I mean, I'm saying this wasn't that long. That was like probably back in 1970-something where kids were still getting paddled, right? And then you look at what's going on today, the way they behave, you know, it's because there's no fear of being dealt with. Anyway, I don't know where, how, why I went off on that, but look at Proverbs chapter 20. How much is enough? And people are too, they're real afraid of, you know, of, let me just say it, of, of, of bruising a child on their, on, their, on their backside. But look at verse 30, chapter 20, verse 30. The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. There's nothing wrong with the bruise, folks. Bruises go away. Sometimes, and I remember when we, we first saw that, and, and, and look, I know this is, could, get, could even get me in trouble just saying it, but look, when there's a bruise, it's not the end of the world. The Bible says it's actually a good thing. So keep that in mind when you're talk, asking yourself, how far is too far? The blueness of the wound cleanseth away evil. So do stripes the inward part of the belly. And let me just say this, you know, as far as it comes to this whole, you know, how much and when and with what, you know, it's a learning process for both of you. The child's learning, but so is the parent when they're, when they're starting out. And they gain wisdom. And like I said earlier, not that it matters. The next question a lot of people have is, well, is it legal? It, you know what? Actually, it is legal to spank your children in Arizona. You, know, they, you have that right as, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a parent to spank your children. So you say, well, I don't know, I, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, go over to Proverbs chapter 29. You know, here's the thing. It benefits both parties. You know, it's going to benefit your child if you, if you spank them. It's going to teach them right from wrong. It's going to teach them there's consequences for their actions. It's going to impart wisdom unto them. It's going to drive foolishness from their heart. What, what's not? It's nothing but good. There's no negativity. The only negative uh, negativity is the process of having actually chasing a child. It's not supposed to be chased. No chasing is, is pleasant, right? But not only does it benefit the child, it also benefits the parent. Look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, right? Rod and reproof. You know, kids should be told why they're getting spanked. They should get the rod, but they should also get the reproof. You're getting them spanking because this. So then they can, you know, learn to not do that. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Okay? Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give thee delight unto thy soul. 
you know, that's, that's, that's a benefit for the parent. You know, the kids benefit, you know, the, it says there, the rod of proof, it gives wisdom. Children are made wiser by it. But man, some parents, they need some rest. They need delight. They want, if you want to, they, they can have no joy. They have no delight in their children because their children are just a terror. I mean, parents that just, they, they, all they want to do is get away from their kids because their kids are just uncontrolled brats. And they just, they want to get away. And they, they, they'll ship them off, they'll send them off, whatever. But, you know, they, that they're all about getting away from their kids. You know, I love being around my kids. My kids are a delight unto my soul. You know, I take Mondays off. We look forward to that. You know, that we look forward to just hanging out with the kids, being with dad, dad being with the kids, having a good time, laughing, maybe going doing something if it ever cools off, right? <laughs> you know, we enjoy, I enjoy my children. Amen. You know why I'm able to enjoy them? You know why I'm able to delight in them? You know why they give me rest? It's because we've dealt with them and are working on the foolishness of their heart. They're not just these uncontrolled you know, little hellions. Wait, they're just, a, you know, a, you know, a pain in the neck. Now, no child's perfect, but you know what I'm talking about, folks. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. Those kids that are out there that are just constant, that nobody wants to be around because they're spoiled little brats because they're just terrors under everyone that they, they come in contact with. And you can't, you know, as frustrating it is with those kids, they're really not the ones to blame, are they? They're just, that's just a foolishness that's bound in their heart that hasn't been dealt with just coming out. It's just their nature. It's the parents' fault for not having dealt with them. It's Amen. the poor parenting. No one enjoys parenting a brat. You know, the rod of proof will help them, but it will also give you rest. And it'll cause you to have delight in your children. They'll be a delight unto your soul. You'll enjoy them. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, these are going to make lasting impressions. These are... The lessons that they learn through discipline are things that are going to stay with them through their whole life. And you know, beating your children, it's going to impart wisdom unto them, but it's also, and it's going to give you rest as a parent, but it's also going to teach them about the nature of God. It teaches them about the nature of God. And, and but go over to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13 again. Proverbs 23, verse 13. Yeah, Proverbs 23, verse 13. I mean, it teaches them about God. I mean, you say, well, that's mean. Beat your kids. Well, what about God? I mean, God beats his children, you know, spiritually speaking. I mean, I can look back in my Christian life, and I was out of sorts with the Lord. Wasn't doing what I should be doing. Was doing things I shouldn't be doing. I can look back and say, oh, yeah, that's why I suffered in this area. I mean, God never showed up with a belt in his hand and dealt with me. But, you know, life, he uses the circumstances and events in life. Your health, your finances, your relationships. He can use those things to chasten you. Just take the joy of the Lord out of your heart. You don't have it. You know, life just becomes a drudgery, trying to live the Christian life, so on and so forth. You know, God chases but his children. But how about this? God sends people to hell. God takes people and throws them in a literal lake of fire for all of eternity. And you're going to say, well, we're cruel for, for teaching our children, you know, right from wrong. No, what you're teaching them is that there's consequences for your actions. There's consequences for sin. In fact, with God, there are eternal consequences for sin. When we beat our children, you're teaching them about the very nature of God, that he punishes people for their actions. The Bible said, you know, the simple is worn and made wise unto life eternal. Okay? Beating your children will help them get saved. Now, I'm not saying you have to beat your kids or they won't get saved, but I am saying this. That if you beat your kids, it's going to teach them about God, about right and wrong, and it's going to help them get saved. Look at Proverbs 20, 13, verse 13. It says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest with, him with the rod, he shall not die. He shall not die if you beat him with the rod. Because it doesn't say if you spank your kids, they're, they're going to live forever. Sarcasm, if you look at it that way, he's saying, look, get over it. You beat your kids. They're not, it's not going to kill them. It's, in fact, it's going to be good for them. You know, it's not going to kill your kid to beat them. But think about it this way. Here's another way to look at it. If you correct your child, if you beat them with the rod, they shall not die. Meaning, you know, it's going to help them avoid that second death. I mean, look at the rest of the verse. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. You know, he's not being figurative there. I mean, look, you're going to help deliver your child from eternity in hell. Which is called the second death, right? 
Beat him with the rod, he shall not die. He'll have eternal life. He's gonna, it's going to open up his heart to the truth of the gospel. I believe that. That's what it says there. Thou shalt deliver a soul from hell. Say, so I want my kid to get saved. Well, are you teaching them right from wrong? Are you teach them there's a consequences for their actions? Are you tell them, teach them that there's any punishments for, for sin? Because that's a major part of the gospel, isn't it? Isn't that where we all start when we're out preaching the gospel, people? You're a sinner. It's real. We all deserve to go there. That's like, that's first base with the gospel. You don't go, I mean, you have to have that. And that's what beating your child with a rod will do for them in their life. It'll open their, their, their spiritual understanding up to the fact that there are consequences for sin that are very negative. You know, we could talk about Timothy, about the fact that, you know, he, he was given, you know, he had the faith that he saw the example. In fact, let's just go over there. We'll close the second Timothy chapter one. I know I'm going long, okay? Second Timothy chapter one. I'll begin reading in verse five, okay? Because I think he's a great example of what I just talked about, about how wisdom is imparted unto people and they get saved. And it's done through, you know, part of it is, is the rod and reproof. It's not just reproof, and it's not just rod, it's both. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So look, where did, he, where did Timothy get his faith? From his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. They dwelt in her, them first. You know, they were teaching him the word of God. I believe that. They were teaching him the Old Testament law. They were teaching him. I, I, I have no doubt in my mind that Lois and Eunice probably had Proverbs. They were reading Proverbs too. They were reading the same passages we read this morning about beating their child with a rod. Do you me to believe that Timothy never got a spanking growing up? I don't believe it. And it made him wise unto salvation. Right? They beat him with the rod and delivered his soul from hell. And not only that, made a, a great man of God out of him in the process. Made it a, a good Christian. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child, verse 15, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. And you know what? It was because mom and dad, or not mom, I don't know if dad was, but mom, you know, Louis, Lois and Eunice, his grandmother and his mother were teaching him these things. They were making him wise. Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Look, before it could enter into his heart, I guarantee you, when they were teaching him these things, there was rod and reproof. It wasn't just all them teaching him the Scriptures. I guarantee you, in Timothy's life, there was a rod that was there. And his, his grandmother and his mother used to loosen up the foolishness that was in Timothy's heart and make him wise unto salvation. <clears throat> now, of course, obviously children who are not disciplined can get saved just the same as anybody else. Right? You know, I'm walking proof of that. You know, that, you know, just because you didn't get properly dealt with as a child doesn't mean you're, you can't get saved. That'd be stupid to say. But I'm saying it helps a lot. I believe that's the Bible's teaching here. I think that's why children who grow up in a Christian home where, where, where you know, uh, physical discipline is practiced, they get, usually get saved pretty young. They get saved at a younger age. You know, it helps them understand the concept of good and bad, reaping and sowing at an early age. And, you know, that's the message this morning, you know, is that you need to discipline your children. The Bible commands it, thou shalt be. Not if you feel like it. It says you should do it. And deliver their soul from hell. The rod and the reproof. You know, and it's unpopular. And it's it's frowned upon. But the Bible teaches it. it and it's very pra it teaches practical, physical discipline. It's what's going to make wise the simple. Let's go ahead and pray.